The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make prize picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three-pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the PrizePix community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. The Coca Cola Company, Cure Dr. Pepper, and PepsiCo are bringing consumers more choices with less sugar than ever before. From sparkling, flavored, and bottled waters to zero sugar sports drinks, teas, and sodas, consumers are taking advantage of these choices. In fact, nearly 60% of beverages sold contain zero sugar. To learn more, visit balanceus.org. Welcome. Hello. It is Eric Erickson here. The Eric Erickson Show across the nation. The phone number is 877 877- 973-7425 if you want to be a part of this here program i want to play you some audio uh this is brian stelter on his cnn plus show that is now dead uh one of his very last shows talking about a washington post article by the twitter troll taylor lawrence uh exposing the information of the woman who runs an account on Twitter called Libs of TikTok, where all she does is she reposts the already publicly available videos of uh, people on TikTok and shows the rest of the world what they're saying on TikTok. And oftentimes it's progressive teachers attacking parents, attacking conservatives, attacking traditional values or amplifying various deviancies, uh, claiming that they're going to keep uh, indoctrinating kids. This is Brian Seller on the article. we we'll have the latest on Elon Musk shortly, but we're leading today's show with the rarely seen human toll of America's latest fight over LGBTQ rights. Let's just be honest. Hate and homophobia is lurking right beneath the surface in American politics right now. Years of increasing acceptance of gays and transgenders is provoking a backlash on right-wing talk shows and in state houses. That's the backdrop for this Washington Post piece about libs of TikTok, a Twitter account that shares and sometimes ridicules public posts from progressive educators and others deemed libs. Taylor Lorenz's story revealed the identity of the conservative woman running libs of TikTok, and now there's a roiling debate about her story and the ethics of it, but there's no debating the influence of the libs of TikTok account. It's even helped inform Florida's recent parental rights law deemed the don't say gay bill by opponents. So here's what I want to know. What's it like to be caught in the middle of all this? What's it like for an educator who says the don't say gay law is a life or death issue for young trans people? He goes on to interview a a teacher who is one of the teachers who was profiled on the uh, Libs of TikTok account. What he does not do, and this is very notable, what he does not do is actually play the audio. I'm noticing this pattern. I'm noticing a pattern. Brian Stelter on CNN, you would think if he was covering the topic of the libs of TikTok accounts and he had on a teacher who was impacted by it, you would play, her name is Mavi Ramirez, you would play the actual video, but he doesn't, He, he doesn't play the video. And uh, in the video, she claims that she calls it the don't say gay uh, law, that teachers wouldn't be able to talk about their sexuality and, and, and claim simply saying the word gay could get you fired. She says that in the video, Brian Seller doesn't post it. What I find interesting, even about the original Taylor Lawrence story, 
is that they're not actually showing the videos. Last hour on this program, I covered a Washington Post story about what's going on in Shanghai, China. And throughout the story, they there were embedded audio clips from Twitter and TikTok so that the viewers or the readers of the story online could see for themselves what's happening through these videos. It is notable that the Washington Post in this Taylor Lawrence story attacking the Libs of TikTok account never posted the actual TikTok videos that the Libs of TikTok account were highlighting. I can't play them for you on this program because they are often profanity laced. Some of them talk about uh, how they are grooming kids, how uh, they want to normalize pedophilia how they do uh, think of themselves as the kids' parents. Some of them excoriate the parents, saying, F the parents. We keep them in, in the dark. We don't tell them what's going on. They didn't highlight any of those videos, the ones that have caused the outrage, the ones of the Florida teachers. Why can't they show the videos? In fact, Twitter itself has multiple times turned off the libs of TikTok account for no real explanation. All they're doing is recirculating these videos that are already public. Why? Why can't you, why won't you show the videos? Because they don't want you to know the truth. And that, my friends, gets us to Elon Musk. Elon Musk says he has raised the money to buy Twitter. This is from haha, the Washington Post. He says he has secured $46.5 billion in financing to acquire Twitter. In a Security and Exchange Commission filing, Musk lists three sources for the offer. The first two would be loans from investment bank Morgan Stanley worth $13 billion and $12.5 billion, uh, respectively. The third is an equity commitment of $21 billion from Musk himself, but it leaves him responsible for delivering $21 billion in cash on his own while providing no details on how he will come up with the money. He is the world's richest man with a net worth of $249 billion. Much of his wealth is in Tesla and rocket building company SpaceX. He's the CEO of both. The offer marks a major escalation in a weeks-long battle by Musk to gain influence at Twitter, where he's got more than 82 million followers. He quietly started buying shares this year to amass more than 9%. The company put out a poison pill, essentially offering other, other people who already own shares of Twitter to be able to buy it on the cheap. And now there is an absolute meltdown on the left from people because Elon Musk might have the audacity to allow free speech on Twitter, allow people on Twitter to actually say what they want without being banned. Uh, Danielle Modi was on CNN. And yeah, we've heard a lot I'm this sorry, week. Th I'm sorry, this is uh, Al Sharpton on MSNBC with Daniel Modi. And yeah, we've heard a lot this week about billionaire entrepreneur and uh, Tesla CEO Elon uh, uh, Musk, who has made a $43 billion offer for Twitter to, quote, build an arena for free speech. Uh, Musk has accused Twitter of censoring its users. Are you concerned that what Musk is trying to do is to open up the platform for more misinformation about topics such as COVID-19 and the 2020 election? and perhaps even allow former President Trump to get his account back. I mean, I'm going to be honest. Elon Musk is a danger to Twitter and to freedom of speech. He has been known to say some of the most transphobic and homophobic things to his millions of followers. So creating an arena for hate, to me, that's what that sounds like, an opportunity for him to have no consequences, to have no flags for people just to be able to do whatever it is and say whatever they want, with regardless of what kind of um, uh, harm that it causes. So I think that this is something that folks really need to be paying attention to, because I think that Elon Musk buying Twitter or creating this quote-unquote arena would be problematic. 
Here is uh, someone from Business Insider. Musk's record at Tesla of, of uh, you know, a, a, a toxic environment. Um, must not the Twitter employees be um, uh, on the ceiling about this? And, They're and terrified. Up in arms? Mm -hmm. They're yeah. terrified. They know he creates toxic work environments. They've had all these meetings about it inside Twitter. Everybody's freaking out. But um, Elon doesn't care. You know, Elon is mostly doing this because it amuses him and he enjoys watching people freak out when he does things. He loves watching kind of throwing a rock in the pond and watching the ripples wave through. Um, and Wall Street is always happy to see him take more and more risk because it means maybe they can have some of his stuff. So we'll see how, how this plays out. But I think the board has a real argument for saying, look, we've made changes to our moderation in for the good of the platform for the health and safety of our community and, and, and the country and the world. And this guy is trying to set us back. That's not good for shareholders. It's not good for the stock. It's definitely not good for the country. Not good for the company if he allowed free speech. One last one. This is Brian Stelter again on CNN. Right. No, people don't want to play in the gutter. Most people don't want to send out their kids to play in the gutter. Twitter's tried to clean it up somewhat. Still, mm -hmm. still got mm -hmm. still a lot of complaints from a lot of people about how Twitter does that. And I think if you're if you're a random user that gets suspended for no good reason, you feel that, and that's a big deal, and that's a big problem. But I, the argument that make Twitter more chaotic yep. would seem to be a losing argument from an investor. Why are they opposed to free speech? It's actually fascinating to me to see so many progressives hate the idea of allowing people to say what they think on social media. They get to now. Let me tell you about my experience with Twitter. My account got turned off. My account got turned off on two separate occasions by Twitter. Had to delete tweets to come back to Twitter. One was uh, I made a joke about Elizabeth Warren said she was going to uh, pass the Wampum Act. I forget exactly what I said the acronym was, um, but essentially a Blame America First acronym for Wampum. And, oh, it was, it was hate speech. It was hate speech. Hate speech. I, I uh, targeted a marginalized community. The second time was I pointed out that the New Zealand transgender weightlifter, Laurel Hubbard, is a man. They deleted or they, they suspended my account for saying accurately, and I said biological, Laurel Hubbard is biologically a man. That is a true and factual statement. And Twitter turned off my account for saying a true and factual statement. And so you've got people like Stelter and others, they won't show the clips. They won't show the clips of the libs of TikTok. They want you to agree with their characterization without showing them to you. And then they're worried about Twitter blocking or, or allowing misinformation. But the fact of the matter is what they ignore is that oftentimes what Twitter is doing is they're turning off the accounts of people telling the truth. It's not misinformation. It's not disinformation. Twitter is targeting people who are telling the truth. And I find it very notable that the same people upset about that, that Twitter would, would have to allow people, if Elon Musk bought them, that they're also not willing to share the actual videos of the people on libs of TikTok. They, they, want to mis they want to characterize it, and they're not even characterizing it accurately or honestly. They themselves are engaged in disinformation and misinformation. What it really comes down to is... They don't actually want the competition. They don't want the competition. All right. Now I'm going to go to the phones. The phone number is 877-973-7425. I want to take Arlene's phone call before I get to the break. Arlene, thanks for being patient with me. How are you? Good afternoon, Eric. Thanks for taking my call. I just wanted if you would please give some insight on the 13th district congressional race where there are three uh, Democrats with one incumbent and three Republicans that are running. Of course, I'm pulling for the Republican Cesar Gonzalez. Now, let me see. I, I got to pull this. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so it, this, this is one Ar Arlene, and I'm glad you bring this up because um, we're going to go through these. I, I want to give you the demographics of the 13th Congressional District. Now, keep in mind, it has changed a little bit, but by and large, it is 58% black, 28% white, 10% Hispanic, 3% uh, Asian. 
Oh, I get these questions all the time. Y'all, uh, the district, though redrawn, is still a Democratic district. Uh, whether we like it or not, some of these districts are drawn so that only a Democrat or only a Republican can win. And my personal view is, while you may have a favored candidate who is a Republican in a district, if the district is drawn to be a 30% Democratic district, that means a a Democrat will get 30% more of the vote than a Republican, you're wasting your time. And I know it makes the candidates mad because, oh, no, I got a chance to win. I got a chance to run. Remember Kimberly Kallick? She was uh, had that viral video. She was running in Baltimore. The district was uh, Democrat plus 23 23% more Democrats than Republicans vote in that district. So I can win, I can win, I can win, I can win, I can win. And the video went viral. Republicans wrote her big checks and she lost because the district was designed. This is what people forget, that districts are designed to be Republican or Democrat or swing. This district is designed to be a Democratic district. Stacey Abrams got 76% of the vote in it in 2018. Joe Biden got 75% of the vote in 2020. Hillary Clinton got 71% of the vote in it in 2016. Uh, The Democrat is going to win the district. It doesn't matter who the Republican is. Jesus Christ himself, if he ran as a Republican, would lose in the district. That's just the hard truth. Hello there, it is Eric Erickson here. The phone number, 877-973-7425. To the phones we go. Vincent, you're going to be up next. Welcome. Hey, Eric. Uh, yeah, I, so I've got an interesting question for you. And it goes back a little bit to what you were talking about before. So in looking at 2024, let's say that Jill Biden props Joe up enough to run again. I don't think Pete Buttigieg is going to sit by, and I don't think Stacey Abrams for sure is going to stand by. I think they'll get in the primary and try to primary Biden. If that happens, what are the chances Kamala is going to sit by and let it happen? I mean, can she challenge Joe? Yeah, okay, so I, here's my theory. I actually, Vincent, think that if Biden runs again, Uh, He may very well be challenged from the left, uh, maybe even by Bernie Sanders. I don't think Mm -hmm. you'll see one of his cabinet secretaries challenge him because that would go over bad with the superdelegates of the Democratic Party. They'd punish him. Uh, My personal view is that Biden is not going to run again. He can say all day long he's going to run again until the moment he does Mm -hmm. it. I'll believe it when I see it. And I don't think anybody's going to give Kamala a pass. In fact, I wouldn't. It would surprise me if you didn't see a Buttigieg Abrams tag team effort to go after Kamala Harris. Now, Abrams, of course, will be a two time loser in Georgia, which means she will have been uh, the governor of Georgia for two terms uh, by the time she runs. So she'll have a level level of credibility there. Um, In her mind, yeah. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Uh, But yeah, Buttigieg, I mean, all of the. uh, it It is a known fact in Washington, D.C., that every hit job in the press about the incompetence of Kamala Harris's team comes from Pete Buttigieg's office. It is, you talk to reporters in Washington, it is an absolute open secret that uh, the Buttigieg team, he wants to run for president of the United States, and Kamala Harris is the only thing in his way, and he is ruthlessly destroying her now in anticipation of running in 2024. Vincent, thanks for the phone call. Okay, the rest of you on the phones, 877-973-7425. We will take your phone calls when we come back. But before I get to anything else, I got to just tell you this throwaway story. Pour one out for Barack Obama. Spotify has refused to renew the podcasting deal with Obama. So they hadn't really produced. This is very much like Harry and Meghan uh, Markle. They they haven't really produced a lot, but Spotify gave them a lot of money to produce. It's kind of been a nothing burger. I did see Netflix has a deal with Obama, and I turned on Netflix the other day, another reason to cancel Netflix, and it was a big, big thing on his tour of uh, American National Parks. That that's That's his big shtick on Netflix right now. It is amazing to me how corporate America throws so much money at the Obamas and progressives in general. I mean, where do conservatives go to cash in? George W. Bush never got a deal like this when he left the presidency. It's exclusively for progressives, which is another reason why so many people are fine going after the woke corporations of America. 
perfectly fine. I'm surprised that, uh, what's her name, Disney, Abigail Disney or whoever, isn't defending Florida now uh, for getting rid of special interests for Disney since she's so opposed to them. Uh, but, of course, she won't because progressives, it's all about the money and the power for them. Hello there, it's Eric Erickson here. Glad to have you with me. The phone number, 877-973-7425. Janice has been waiting super patiently. Almost an hour, Janice. I'm sorry I made you wait that long. How are you? I'm fine, Eric. Thank you so much for taking my call. And also, thank you for being truthful with us. There's not many reporters that are truthful anymore. Thank but you. But anyway... Um, my question is, most of the polls, uh, they tell us that, you know, the Democrats are in trouble, not only this November, but in 2024. But if you watch their body language, they don't seem to be upset about that, and they don't seem to be concerned with all these illegal immigrants marching into our country. Now, here's my question. Could they give out enough green cards uh, to these illegal immigrants and have them just pull them over the finish line in November as well as 2024? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, they they would have to be able to process all of the illegal immigrants, and they would have to be able to show that they've been in the country for a certain period of time to be eligible for green cards. And because they came in illegally, they wouldn't be eligible for the green cards, so they would have to route them through the embassy in Mexico and apply there. Uh, the bureaucratic hassles would, would be very difficult. And the problem with that is it would probably push even more Hispanic voters in this country to the GOP. So it would almost be a, a, a it would, it would kind of be a split uh, for every one that they were able to process and get into the country on the promise of voting Democrat would probably push one here to become even more Republican. So I, I, I don't know that the math would add up for them uh, to be okay. able to do something like that. Uh, and I will tell you that if word even got out, and there's no way the government can keep a secret like this, um, if word got out, the number one fear among Democrat uh, party strategists at this moment is Hispanic voters in Nevada because that state redrew their congressional districts to eliminate any Republican from being able to hold a congressional seat and to dominate the state legislature. And they are on the verge of losing Nevada to the GOP for the first time in a very long time because oh, wow. the Hispanic voters in Nevada are so upset. The Democratic Party, Janice, most Americans don't know what happened. Uh, Harry Reid, who was the Senate Majority Leader, built the Nevada Democratic Party and made it so strong that for the first time in, I think, 30 or 40 years, Nevada now has a Democratic governor, and they've been dominating the state. They took over the state legislature. But the Democratic Socialists of America decided to set up shop in Nevada and take control of the Democratic Party. And the result is Hispanic voters in Nevada, many of whom immigrated to this country to get away from socialists, have now flipped to the GOP. And so the Nevada Democratic Party is at civil war, and Nevada Hispanic voters are voting, I think I read today in NBC, five to one Republican now, uh, which means the Democrats are about to get wiped out. They drew a congressional map, Janice, so that Republicans could not win a single seat in Congress from Nevada. And the latest oh, wow. poll in Nevada shows Republicans are going to win every single one of the seats, all five of them. Because oh, I'm the so Hispanic glad voters, to hear yes, that. they overplayed their hand. Uh, they, they completely overplayed their hand, and they they infuriated legal Hispanic voters in the country. So they, I'm sorry it took so long to, to get to you, but thank you for the phone call. That's something, y'all. There's nothing permanent in American politics. There never has been. There never will be. Uh, when Teddy Roosevelt was president of the United States, uh, oh, what was the guy's name? He was Roosevelt's political genius, Teddy Roosevelt's um, political guru. What what was the guy's name now? Um, got, uh, Mark Hanna. Mark Hanna. Uh, when, uh, when Mark Hanna got Teddy Roosevelt into the presidency, Mark Hanna it had been with him as governor of New York, vice president, uh, into the presidency, got him reelected, and began to structure and realign American politics to ensure a permanent Republican political majority. 
And within a decade, it all blew up on him, and the Democrats had won. When Karl Rove got George W. Bush into the White House, remember Carl, George Bush, he did steel tariffs in Pennsylvania and all these sorts of things to preserve a political, a permanent political majority for the GOP. Within six years, the Democrats had taken back Congress. When Barack Obama became president, David Axelrod, uh, I know David Axelrod. David Axelrod is a nice guy. He and his wife are lovely people. He's very much a Democrat. And he and, and the Democrats in the White House, uh, what is it, Jim Messina, they wanted a permanent Democratic political majority. And they structured the rules. They targeted the DOJ after state redistricting, all this stuff. And within a year, the Republicans had taken back the House. Within four years, the or six years, the Republicans had taken back the Senate. And then Donald Trump got elected. And then the Republicans were like, well, you can have a permanent political majority. Look at this. And within two years, the Democrats. There's no such thing as a permanent political majority in the country. And the number one reason is because voters, in addition to being stupid, no offense, but come on, people are stupid. And voters are people. But voters are fickle. This is why I've urged caution in being too aggressive against Disney in Florida, not because I don't want to fight Disney, but because I want the Republicans to preserve their majority for as long as possible. And the way you do that is to move slow. It's like the the the, the, the proverbial frog in the boiling pot of water. You throw it right in the boiling water, it jumps out. You, you let the water come up to heat, it, it cooks in the water. You let the voters slowly come to your side. They stay with you for a long time. You can get a decade. You can get two decades. Democrats held the House of Representatives for 40 years, but that was largely a uh, historic uh, aftermath of the Civil War. But at this point, there's no such thing as permanence. But if the Republicans slowly move Hispanic voters their way, they can get as close to permanence as possible, a decade or two in power, and fundamentally realign this country to benefit the free market and the free peoples of the country against progressives. But you got to be diplomatic in how you do it. You can't just rush in guns blazing. The problem for the Democrats is they're the ones rushing in guns blazing, and it's pushing Hispanic voters, legal Hispanic voters, to the GOP. Now, uh, to the phones, Cliff, you're going to be next. Welcome. Hey, how you doing? Good. How are you? Just fine. I used to call you regularly from Warner Robins, but you moved up to Atlanta. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So anyway, I've had this idea, and I knew I could share it with you that it would maybe the Republicans here in Georgia would use it. It's a, a campaign ad for Governor Kemp, Herschel Walker, and others that are running in you know state offices against the Democrats. It's a train going down the tracks, and you can obviously see it's fixing to go off the track and have a major wreck. And in the in the uh, lead of the train, you know, running the train is Stacey Abrams, President Biden, Senator Warnock, Pelosi, and others. And behind them, you see them pulling the cars uh, with inflation, border crisis, crime, and war, and COVID. All of those in the cars behind them, and they're just grinning like a possum. Going down the tracks, and the train is just about to crash. <laughs> and <laughs> look, anyway, uh, their train is going to crash. That that that's that's uh, it, it's it's kind of I don't know this this is the weird thing for me. Uh, and, and look, uh, Cliff, I I appreciate you you coming, y'all. I've I've been a student of politics for years. So just for those of you who are new listening. Uh, he, he, let, let me just be serious with you for just a moment here. No flippancy here. As pretty much all of you know, I grew up in Dubai. We lived there, moved there uh, when I was in kindergarten, really in, in the first grade, 80 to 90, basically 10 years. Came back when I was 15 years old, five to 15, lived in Dubai. And I was never really an athlete growing up. My dad had been a basketball coach, had been in football. I was never really the athlete. My sisters were the athletes. I, I was the bookworm. I was the nerd. I was also the good kid. I never got in trouble. I'm not making that up. I just never got in trouble. Loved to cook, um, read a lot, uh, loved computers. And so I was never into real sports. I mean, in Dubai, you had cricket, camel racing. You, you, we finally got like American football. I did play baseball for a little bit, but... I mean, you, you, you had soccer, and it was hot, 100 degrees. I wasn't going to play soccer. 
American politics kind of became the thing that connected me to the country and in, uh, shut up, shut up. There's a vacancy at the Eric Erickson show. I need a new producer. <laughs> um, Charlie says, you weren't an athlete. No, um, I wasn't, uh, admittedly so. Uh, but so I connected to the U S through the news. I loved, I was a, I was a news guy. I love news and I love politics. And when I came back to the States, uh, I wanted to volunteer in politics. I'm fascinated by politics. I was from Louisiana, very fascinated by Louisiana politics, moved to Georgia, uh, went to a school, did not have a college Republicans group. I started the college Republicans at my alma mater, Mercer University, back in the mid nineties, uh, started, uh, became the chairman of the Georgia college Republicans. Actually, uh, it was the last chairman of the Georgia uh, Federation of College Republicans and became the first president of the Georgia Association of College Republicans. Uh, it was a, there was scandal. I had to clean up somebody else's mess and, and restart the group and became a political consultant, uh, became a political analyst and contributor for CNN and Fox, fell into talk radio by accident. I love politics. I ran campaigns. I've run campaigns around the country. I was a volunteer uh, lawyer for President Bush's campaign. I've run congressional campaigns. I've run state campaigns. I've run local campaigns, I've run um, countywide campaigns. I'm a student of politics. I don't care whether it's Republican or Democrat. I'm fascinated by the politics of the age. I'm fascinated by how you run campaigns. I'm fascinated by the science and the art because it's both. How do you find the voters who are persuadable? Like the lady who called earlier about the 13th Congressional District in Georgia. It's not worth your time if you're a Republican because that district is specifically drawn so that only a black Democrat can get elected. I'm sorry that upsets you. There is a science to it, and that's the science part of it. What about a swing district or what about a Republican district? How, what is the science and what is the art of persuading people to you? How do you design the mail? How do you ask the questions of the polls? How do you do the phone calls? How do you do the volunteering? How do you do the TV? How do you do the radio? Where do you go? Who do you speak to? How do you build a campaign? How do you? F- I love that stuff. And it doesn't matter whether it's Democrat or Republican. I'm fascinated by it. And so I say all of that to say I am genuinely flabbergasted the Democrats have gotten as bad as they are right now because we all know what's coming. Every single one of us knows what's coming. They know what's coming. They do. They know what's coming. Privately, you talk to Democrats right now, they absolutely know what's coming. They they do. I, I'm not making that up. They do. And yet, They keep making mistakes and making it worse. And there are people, and this is why I tend to dismiss the idea that it's all part of some master plan. Because if it's part of a master plan, it's Batory, that's for sure, because they ain't pulling anything off. They're just tugging tubing somewhere on a Zoom call, I guess, because it is absolutely mind-boggling to me that they, some of the, the brilliant democratic strategists of America that I've seen, even they are like, what has happened to our party? I don't, I really, I don't understand what's happened. All I can think is, and, and no one will tell me this, but it is genuinely, truly my internalized belief that there is behind the scenes a bigger fight between the progressives and the liberals in the Democratic Party. The liberals are on the left and the progressives are on the far left. There aren't really any moderates left. And what the the what they've both decided is they they see the train wreck coming. They know the train wreck is coming, and what they're both sides are doing is they're trying to lay the foundation to be able to blame the other side. They all know they're going to get swept out to sea by the voters, and what they're doing now is not trying to prevent it, but trying to build the case that it's the other side to blame. The progressives want to blame the liberals. The liberals want to blame the progressives. That's the only way I can make sense of what's happening this year in the Democratic Party because the train wreck is coming. You can see it. They're about to go off the cliff. There's this giant red wave on the horizon that approaches by the minute. And everything Joe Biden does at the behest of progressives in the White House makes it worse. The mask mandate lawsuit repeal, Title 42 coming undone or maybe not, 
everything makes it worse. And all I can think is that they're trying to lay groundwork to blame each other and then rebuild headed into 2024, a, a left versus far left fight. That's it. That's the only way I can understand what's happening to the Democratic Party right now, because these are not dumb people. They know how to win. They know history is against them. And instead of mitigating the damage, it's like they are going for broke to just, I mean, wipe them out as best they can. And somebody will be there to pick up the pieces. And the left and the far left are both fighting each other for who will be the person to pick up the pieces. It's fascinating to watch them knowing what's coming and making the situation worse every day. I probably should tell them if they want to improve the situation. You might want to try the Eden Pure Thunderstorm and at least clear the air, uh, I mean, fr- from from their celebrations they've had from yesterday, among other things. Uh, the Eden Pure Thunderstorm wipes out the smoky odors, the pet odors. I don't know that it can get rid of the, the odors of what's coming from them, but nonetheless, they could try it. It'll also get rid of the mildew, the mold, the bacteria, the pollen that's floating in the air, and it's filterless. You just wipe it out on occasion. I keep one in my suitcase. I travel with it. If the hotel room stinks or the rental car stinks, I can plug in the Eden Pure Thunderstorm, let it run, and it wipes out the odors. What you do right now, if you want a three-pack, one for upstairs, one for downstairs, one for your basement or your RV or your car, you go to EdenPureDeals.com. Eden like the Garden of Eden. Go to EdenPureDeals.com, and you put in the discount code ERIC. Three E R I C K three, and you will get three Eden Pure Thunderstorms for less than two hundred dollars. You're saving two hundred dollars, and you get free shipping. The website again is Eden Pure E D E N Eden Pure Deals dot com, and the discount code is Eric E R I C K and the number three, no space. Eric three. Hello there, welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. I yay! I'm excited. I just secured tickets to the Judah and the Lion concert in Atlanta. Uh, They're coming through in October. I was supposed to go to Judah and the Lion and COVID hit and I couldn't go. And I think they still have the, they might've actually canceled that concert, but it's nice. The world is slowly coming back to normal. I was in, um, where was I? Uh, I was in Atlanta yesterday. That's where I was. Um, My gosh. Uh, And a buddy of mine was down at the two dead mayors international airport in Atlanta uh, Hartsfield and Jackson is the name. Hartsfield Jackson. They're two dead mayors. So two dead mayors, international airport. And he was saying uh, there were very few people with masks on. And another friend of mine was on a flight. He said, maybe 20% of the people on the plane are wearing masks. Uh, part of this, let's be honest here is religion. And I know people don't like to talk about it that way, but it is true. Uh, It is you want to signal your tribe and your virtue and your beliefs. And wearing a mask on a plane does that. When you get on the airplane and the airplane pushes back from the gate and is on its own power with its own airflow, uh, it is as clean as if not cleaner than a surgical facility. The air refreshes every three minutes. Uh, The particulate is pushed to the floor, not across from you. Uh, It is very, very clean. And the planes are are also sanitized before you even get on the plane. And so if you're wearing a mask while the plane is flying, what you are doing is signaling your virtue. You're not actually doing yourself any good. Now, I got to tell you. If I was sitting next to someone who begged me, please, please, I'm freaked out about it. I'm scared. I'm immunocompromised. I'd put a mask on for him. I'm, I'm a nice guy. I would. But otherwise, there's no way. I'll go live your life, people. Stop wearing masks now. This hour of the program brought to you by First Liberty Building and Loan in Noonan, Georgia, but they can help you nationwide from Salem, Oregon to Orlando, Florida, and every point in between. Go to them if you need a big loan, $750,000 or more for your business. FirstLibertyGA.com is their website. FirstLibertyGA.com. Tell them I sent you. They have been working with businesses since the early 90s. They can get you to yes where banks are saying no. Spend a few minutes with them. Tell them I sent you. See if they're a good fit for you and you for them. FirstLibertyGA.com. 